Hello everyone, and welcome back to our video Bible study series. This is Functioning as the Lord's Church, and we're now in the new year. Can you believe it? 2021. Uh, but I thank you for clicking on this, for continuing through this study with me. Uh, let's get right back into it. You remember when we're talking about functioning as the Lord's Church, we're trying to answer the question, what exactly do Christians do? And we'll examine the teaching of the New Testament to find this out. Of course, God has a will for his people. Uh, the church is the body of believers, and Christ is our head. And so what instruction has Christ in his teaching and his doctrine given for his followers, for the family of God? Uh, and first, we noted the idea of worship, to talk about the scriptural truth of worship, and that we're required to, to bring that toward God and with the proper attitude to worship in spirit and in truth. And secondly, we talked about evangelism, and we spent a good deal of time talking about what evangelism is. You remember sharing the message of the gospel, and also tried to give some practical application, some conversation starters and different things that would be helpful to us uh, as we're all striving to do that, to get some good studies going and to share this truth with others. Uh, now our, our third subtopic that we want to get into under this umbrella of functioning as the Lord's Church is the idea of benevolence. Uh, now, just seeing the word, it's not one that we would use a, a whole lot in just common speaking today, but I think it's usually understood as a religious word, or at the very least, a, a word of, of charitable organizations. Uh, and just take the minute, you know, in your own mind, when you think of benevolence, what do you think of? I, I think for most people, when they hear benevolence, they think of giving poor people money or food. Uh, you know, trying to give something by way of charity to those who are needy. And although that's part of it, certainly, there's a lot more to this topic and a lot more to the biblical model of this attitude of benevolence. And, and I'm going to challenge you and urge you several times through this study, don't think of benevolence as something that you do so much as the attitude that you have. Uh, to be a benevolent person, not a person who does benevolence. Uh, and I, I realize there's not a whole lot of shades of difference there just in the language of it, but we see the example in the New Testament that our Lord lived out, and we understand the orders that he has given his followers. And just going through the motions is not going to align me with Christ. What's going to line me up with my Savior is when I think and feel like he thought and felt toward others. And benevolence is a key part of that. Another aspect here, and we've hinted at this a little bit already, is that our benevolence efforts would transfer over or play together well with our efforts of evangelism. And you can see this again many times in the life of Jesus and, and his followers, where they would meet a physical need but that would be for the purpose of addressing a spiritual need. And I don't think you'll find where Jesus is just doing physical good for the sake of physical good. It's always to bring about spiritual good. And the idea of someone else's benefit, well, you would want to deal with what has the most lasting effect. You know, when you help someone with a physical need, you help them with the temporary. But when you help someone with a spiritual need, you help them with the eternal. Uh, so there's a, a lot to be said here in, in this area. Also, I think in benevolence, you allow the world to see the beauty of Christianity in a way that's, that's not so much on display in these other areas. You know, a life lived for the Lord, it holds great meaning and great benefit, not just for the one choosing to be faithful, but for each one they have opportunity to meet. Think about it this way. Others are benefited, are bettered for your Christianity. Uh, others benefit from you being loyal to Christ. And you think about it, the idea of love, agape love, that self-sacrificing love driven by decision. That's something that all the world recognizes as good and admirable. When you think about kindness, and kindness makes you beautiful. We need to be attractive in the sense of attracting others to the gospel, drawing others to Christ. Let the beauty of Jesus be seen in you, that concept. 
And, you know, the beauty that we show, it doesn't need to be beauty as the world defines it. It needs to be beauty as we find it in the truth of Scripture. And true kindness, that which speaks to man's lasting benefit, uh, that type of charity or love, that is beautiful. And it's so badly needed in this dark world. Uh, I think a lot of people, when they first come to the truth, when they first uh, come to the church family, they are struck by that, and it does stand out to them what a warm and, and loving group that is found uh, among Christianity. Uh, and it's not to say that other people don't ever show acts of love, uh, but here we find not just the command for it in Scripture, but the perfect model of it in our Lord. And of course, like we said, to tie it to the spiritual good, which is only going to be in the church, uh, to speak the truth of salvation and what it is to live right with Christ day in and day out. Uh, so there's really a lot connected to benevolence, but let's make it bare bones for a minute. Let's talk about definitions. This English word, benevolence, you can find various definitions for it. It is defined as the disposition to do good. Uh, and you think about disposition, well, I am, I am disposed to this. Uh, I have this disposition to do good unto others. And it's that action that you would take toward those you have opportunity to meet. Uh, and so how do you tend to treat others? And a lot of this does reflect on your heart, your attitude that you're showing to the world. Secondly, an inclination toward kind and charitable acts. Uh, now you can see charity in this, of course. You remember charitable acts, uh, but it is acts of love and it is kindness. Uh, the, the word inclination is sort of interesting here. Are you inclined toward that? Uh, the idea of being uh, predisposed to it or inclined to it, there is a tendency to show kindness. And I think with inclination, you can also see desire that you're looking for opportunities to show kindness, looking for opportunities to bestow charitable acts on others, to provide for their good and, and for their needs. Uh, thirdly here, an act of goodwill or consideration. Uh, and you can see again how this is more than like a checklist and, and things that you would do. When we talk about consideration, how do you think of others? Uh, you know, an act of goodwill, and I think goodwill is really a key word we're going to talk more about in just a minute, uh, but to do actions that show you are thinking of others. And that level of consideration is, is I think, rare a lot in society today. A lot of times we see inconsiderate acts, don't we? Well, we are called by our Lord to be considerate, to do good works, uh, and to show benevolence, to have this as part of our daily walk. And this is something that you maybe have to force yourself to think about more, but you can form good habits. So if you are on top of yourself thinking, all right, I need to do this, over time, you can naturally think that way. Uh, and of course, if you have the desire for souls, if you have the desire for others' best spiritual good, it will make sense to try and address some of their physical needs so that you can deal with some of the spiritual as well. I think a lot of these things, they just mesh, they mold together very nicely. Uh, now let's go just one step deeper here. When you talk about our English word benevolence, you can have a little fun uh, looking into the origin of this word. And our English word benevolence actually comes from the Latin. Now I want to talk about this a little bit because I think it does well to spell out this conversation. Uh, I have fun looking at different languages. I, I am by no means a uh, linguist or an expert in this, but you can see benevolence comes from the Latin bene volens, and I, I won't get any of the pronunciation right, but it's fun to break this apart. So that initial piece, the bene, uh, that is good or well. And of course, Latin as a root language, you can see ties to other things we might be familiar with. Uh, the French word bon or the Spanish bueno, that's the same. It's good. And then that second part, valens, or a root word there, volo, it is to will. And you can think about this as volition. Uh, maybe volunteer is an easier way to get this idea across, but it's about your choice. Uh, when you volunteer for something, you choose to be involved here. You exercise your free will. You decide. And so you put it together, what is benevolence? Well, it's when you're using your free will for good. 
<laughs> when you are doing well toward others, bestowing benefit on others, uh, and choosing to be involved in that when you will uh, use that for their good. Uh, and so it is about decision making, uh, but why would we make that decision? Because of how we think, because of how we feel, because of how our heart is and our desire to be like our God. Uh, you think about it, do we make decisions? Do we exercise our free will toward the good of others? Jesus did. Uh, God does constantly. Uh, God is working for us. He has uh, our good in mind, and that's why he treats us far better than we deserve and, and goes above and beyond. That's why Jesus went to the cross for our good. Uh, do we want good for others? Uh, and it's a little tricky to do a word study on benevolence, most versions of the Bible don't even contain the word benevolence. Maybe that's surprising to you. The King James Version, it does contain one usage of the English word benevolence, but it doesn't really correspond to what we're discussing here. Uh, it's used to talk about the husband and wife relationship and showing affection there. So it's, it's kind of a separate discussion. Uh, but although you don't find the word benevolence all over the Bible, the concept is a very scriptural one. And especially when you break it down, as we have, and looked at the Latin a little bit, to exercise your free will towards good, we're talking about the concept of good works. And the New Testament has an awful lot to say about good works. We'll find much to, uh, to spend our time and study on. And it, it only makes sense. You know, the church functioning properly must be involved in doing good works. So the church functioning properly must be involved in benevolence. Uh, we must be people who are benevolent. Uh, now to start looking at scripture, I wanted to begin at what might seem an odd place, but I think it's very fitting. Uh, one of my favorite verses is contained here in this section. It's in Acts chapter 10. And if you remember, this is the chapter about Gentile inclusion. Uh, Peter and Cornelius, they're brought together by the power of God. Peter's declaring to Cornelius and others with him uh, the truth about salvation through Jesus. And you remember the Holy Spirit falls on Cornelius and company. And Peter, the way he explains it later, just as it did on us at the beginning, referring to Acts 2. Uh, and so the idea of Gentiles being included in repentance unto life, or the gospel call, life in Jesus. And you can tie in Galatians 3 that all are one. It no longer matters Jew or Greek. All are one in Christ Jesus. Uh, but here's a, a great description, and contained in it is something said about Jesus, and that's where I want to put the emphasis. So let's, let's read through here. Uh, picking up in the middle of 34, In truth I perceive that God shows no partiality. But in every nation, whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. The word which God sent to the children of Israel, preaching peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. That word you know, which was proclaimed throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. Uh, okay, so there's a lot to like through this section. Uh, God shows no partiality, so no favoritism, and you can see Jew and Gentile both having access, if they will, fear him and work righteousness. Uh, and so to have that recognition towards God, uh, God's ability and character, to use that as motivation for submissive obedience, and to do the work that he has given you to do, to walk rightly, you will be accepted by him. And he says the word which God sent, that's the idea. It's preaching peace through Jesus. He says you're familiar with that word. That's what's being proclaimed as the truth of the gospel. And part of this description of the gospel has to contain a description of Jesus. And so verse 38 says God anointed Jesus uh, with the Holy Spirit and with power. And then following that comma in verse 38, I really want you to see what's next. Who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil. Now, the second part of that, we can very much understand. Healing all who are oppressed by the devil. We certainly have many accounts uh, of Jesus, whether that's casting out an unclean spirit or raising a widow's son, uh, restoring sight to someone who was born blind. You know, his miraculous power was clearly shown. But I don't want us to skip over the first part. 
who was Jesus? He was the one who went about doing good. You know, the healing and, and the miracles, those are really almost presented as separate here after we say this initial statement, he was the one who went about doing good. And when you look at the original language in, in the Greek here, to be doing good, or more literally to be a worker of good, is to bestow benefit. Jesus went about bestowing benefit on all those around. Jesus went about bettering the lives of people he came in contact with. And, and that's a sobering thought. Do I better the life of people I come in contact with? Uh, you know, to be a worker of good. And you can see a lot about his role as the Messiah. Um, that is the true Messiah, not Messiah as the Jewish leaders might have thought he should have been. You know, as Jesus walked this earth, his main business was to travel from place to place to do good. He didn't go trying to gain applause. He didn't go trying to gain wealth. He didn't go for his comfort or ease. He, he didn't go trying to raise a physical army. Uh, no, he went about to bring lasting joy. Uh, think about John 10.10. I'm, I'm come to that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Well, the idea of the abundant life, the idea of true joy, um, that is to speak to man's spiritual need, to answer their sin problem. And you remember uh, when he was born of Mary, part of this promise foretold in prophecy is that he would be Savior, uh, the one to save his people from their sins. And, and this idea of being born of a woman at just the appropriate time to bring all this, uh, yes, Jesus exercised his free will toward the good of others, uh, even choosing to be obedient to the point of death on the cross. This is a beautiful idea. And so our Lord exercised his free will toward the good of others. He chose to be a worker of good. Do we think the way that Jesus thinks? Uh, it is an issue of our hearts. Uh, don't think of benevolence as a checklist or a line item on a budget. It, it's about our attitude. Is our attitude Christ-like or not? Do we go about doing good or not? Uh, where do we exercise our free will? And, and what's shown in that is what we care about, uh, what we value. And if we care about others and value their souls, that should be seen in the actions we take. And yes, the action to share the message of the gospel with them, but also the action to meet some of those physical needs, to provide for those who are hurting, to be there for them, to relieve some of the pain that people experience in this life. Uh, and again, it's never meeting a physical need just for the sake of that. We always want to speak to the eternal part of man, uh, but we don't want to go to the other extreme where we're only going to talk about spiritual matters and we have no time to address uh, physical problems that are there. No, you have to show the same love that our Savior showed. Show that level of care and then people might be more willing to listen to you. It's amazing how these things tie in together. Uh, there's a lot that we want to say about benevolence. I think the first main area that we're going into, benevolence is commanded. Uh, and what I mean by this, and the reason we want to lay out this point, there's a lot of people in the church today who, who I believe make a mistake trying to separate parts of Christianity that are required and then parts of Christianity that they'll say are optional. And so it is required that one be baptized for the remission of sins. But benevolence is optional. They'll say something like that or proclaim something like that by the way they're living. Well, if it's commanded... If it's commanded by our God, if it's commanded in Scripture, if it's given as instruction for God's people, you can't say, well, one's required and one's optional. Uh, it doesn't make sense to say, well, we have to follow God's command when it comes to the plan of salvation, and it's optional to follow God's command when it comes to daily Christian living. Well, no, if we're loyal to God, we're loyal to God. We have to do what he says. And benevolence, you'll find that it's commanded, but this is commanded for our good. This is commanded for our benefit, and you can see God's goodness toward us in that he would direct us to do this. Uh, there's, there's so much here, but let's, let's begin looking at a scripture dealing with money. Uh, now, we said a lot of times when you just hear this word, you think about giving money to the poor. Uh, this is a good scripture to go to because it starts off with kind of a material focus, uh, but you'll see it doesn't end there. It very quickly shifts toward spiritual riches and a spiritual focus. So let's examine 1 Timothy 6, 
17 and 18. It says, Command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty, nor to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God, who gives us richly all things to enjoy. Let them do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to give, willing to share. Uh, Okay, so first off, always kind of provide yourself this warning when you see rich in the text. You don't want to give that knee-jerk reaction and say, oh, well, this is talking to other people, not not to me. No, pause and consider. Uh, We are all very rich. Uh, When you think about living in America versus other countries across the world, and when you just think about the time period in which we live, uh, modern conveniences and the life that you and I experience now being so far removed from the way people lived uh, even a few hundred years ago, it's, it's an amazing change. Uh, and so we are, we are very rich. We are very materially blessed. This command is, is for us. It, it should meet you squarely between the eyes. Command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty. Uh, Now, he's already starting to draw a distinction here. He says, rich in this present age. That's talking about life here on this earth, life in the temporary that James 4 tells us is just a vapor. And so here's a command to those who are temporarily well off. (laughs) He says, don't be haughty. Uh, Don't be puffed up, arrogant, or proud uh, in that state. And he, he talks about how those temporary riches, they're not reliable. He says, don't trust in uncertain riches, but instead in the living God. Uh, Here we see God as certain, right? The riches are uncertain, they're temporary, they're fleeting, uh, but God is certain, he is reliable, he is trustworthy. Uh, You could think about the way Jesus told it, uh, that you would not lay up treasures here on this earth. Why? Because moth and rust can corrupt and thieves can break through and steal but instead lay up treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust can corrupt and where thieves cannot break through or steal. Uh, That's how we're truly blessed. And it is, again, to speak to the eternal, to the spiritual, rather than to the temporary and the physical. So don't trust in uncertain riches, but instead trust in the living God. And I want you to notice this because the last phrase in 17, it really reshapes how we should think about our riches. How should you think about your material goods? Well, it it is God who gives us richly all things to enjoy. And so you wouldn't be haughty and look at your present age riches and say, I did this. No, you would look at your present age riches and say, God gave me these things. And so there, instead of uh, a point for pride, we see a point for gratitude. Uh, And if we are truly grateful, if we're truly thankful toward our God and what he has given us, then we'll have respect toward his command and what he wants us to do with it. Uh, See, it's a totally different way of thinking. It's not, this is mine, what can I do with it for me? It's, this is God's, and God loved me enough to to give it to me, so what does God want me to do with it? Uh, Well, first, God gives us richly all things to enjoy. And the idea of enjoyment, I think you need to zoom out and see God as the loving creator. Uh, you remember at Genesis 1, at the end of that chapter, all things that he has, he has made, they are very good. Uh, or in James chapter 1, I believe it's verse 17, all good gifts, they come from uh, the Father of lights. They come from above, with whom is no variableness or shadow of turning. Uh, and so God gives us all this, but then what do we do with it? Here's the command, verse 18, let them do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to give, willing to share. Okay, so here's the instruction that we receive. Uh, Command those who are rich in this present age to do good. And the phrase for doing good and being rich in good works ties in very nicely with what we saw with Peter and Cornelius. You know, in Acts 10, Jesus went about doing good. Well, if we are Christ-like, if we are trusting in God, if we're laying up treasures in heaven, we're going to do the same. We're going to be workers of good, doers of good. Uh, You could tie in a lot of other good scriptures here. Think about Ephesians 2.10. We are his workmanship made in Christ Jesus for good works. Uh, That's his idea for us. That's his plan for us. And so if we're functioning as the Lord's church, we need to be doing good. Notice also the use of the word rich in verse 18. Be rich in good works. And that's the point of laying up treasures in heaven. Uh, Don't be rich with temporary stuff. 
Don't be rich with physical stuff. Be rich with eternal spiritual things. Be rich in good works. Be rich in service towards God. Really, that's the point. And then we've got these two little phrases kind of at the end here. Ready to give and willing to share. Uh, now, in, in different versions of the Bible, this is often translated in different ways, but the concept is really a pretty basic one. Ready to impart, uh, ready to give, and, and really both of these have that meaning of imparting unto others. And the two categories, or the difference between these two phrases, one is more about the good works, and the other is more about the good words, uh, that communicative idea that we would form bonds with others and, and speak with them. And so you put it all together, ready to give and willing to share. That is, we're going to be generous with what God has blessed us with. And also, we're going to associate with others, ready to impart good, kind words to them. And, of course, to speak the truth of the gospel to them. Uh, you know, consider in Jesus' day as he walked this earth, uh, he associated with people that others would not. And the religious leaders often got upset at who Jesus was willing to associate with. And it was never about condoning their sinful lifestyle. It was about the idea of benevolence. If you're going to go about doing good, you can't say, well, I'm only going to do good to some. Uh, no, God loves all. And if we are loyal to God and feel the same way he does, we desire that all would be saved. And so we're going to see what we can do to help them, to bring some relief. So we're ready to give, we're willing to share, uh, ready to impart good works and good words. Uh, this is the command. It's not an optional extra. Uh, it's not something that's, that's given out. Uh, since you have opportunity, since you have good in this world because God has blessed you with it, you need to use it for good. Uh, we've talked about this concept before. We are blessed in order to be a blessing to others. And with this benevolence always leaning into evangelism, I think, what will the world think of us? How will the world look at us if we are charitable, if we are kind-hearted, and if we have all this because we trust in God? I think that's a very attractive picture. And they would look and say, well, these aren't people who are just money grabbers. These aren't people who are concerned with trying to you know, have everything in this life. These are people who trust in God, who rely on Him. You remember certain rather than uncertain. And they're willing to help anyone and everyone because they know what is truly good. And they'll begin to see that as they spend more time around God's people and hopefully are involved in a study. Those who are outside the church can see we are concerned with the lasting spiritual good of each one. We're concerned with what is good for the soul. And so the idea to draw others to Christ through our good works, through our benevolence, uh, and to tell them you also need to place your trust in that which is certain. Uh, okay, there's some other verses, of course, we want to look at at this point, but I want to go ahead and cut off uh, our study for this time right now. Uh, I did sort of make a personal resolution that I was going to watch the time a little bit better. Uh, I know some of my videos in the past have been very inconsistent, uh, some quite long and some a tad bit shorter. Uh, but we're shooting for around 30 minutes each time, and I'll try and be better about that. Uh, but thank you so much for clicking on this. Thank you for going through this study with me. I uh, hope that you're enjoying it. I think we've got a good introduction, at least, into this topic of benevolence, uh, and we'll be back next week for more. But I hope that you and your family continue to be healthy and well, uh, that you're active in your prayer life and, and busy in God's service, ever faithful to Him. I uh, look forward to seeing you again next time, and until then, God bless you.